Let's try that now. Special guest this morning is Reese Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a surreal experience, uh, as per usual. Uh, Reese, uh, first had me cracking up, actually, when he appeared as the phone-in host Gary Bellamy on Radio 4's spoof show, Down the Line. And now we can watch as Gary meets his loony listeners, because Down the Line has been transformed into BBC Two's newest comedy hit, Bellamy's People. And uh, it's brilliant, because the spoof stars heaps of uh, familiar faces, Paul Whitehouse, Felix Dexter, Charlie Hickson, Simon Day, Amelia Bulmore. Uh, <laughs> but it's just so much like this show in its own funny ways. Mm. Um, did you meet any... I mean, did you listen to phone-in shows? Uh, for we listened, yeah, a lot of the time on the way to when we were recording it, we'd listen to, the, you know, uh, certain talk shows on the radio. And, and you can't make it up sometimes, some <laughs> of the things... You know, we heard one once, uh, someone talking about the benefits of broccoli, you know, a late-night phone-in. And uh, so, yeah, we, you can't really make those sort of things up, but uh, we would just... We'd improvise the whole thing on radio. And I would basically sit in a booth all day long and they'd come in and just, they'd do their... Oh, as if I was really on radio and they'd just, you know, fire things at me and I'd to act as if I really was on, on radio. So it was like a, a, the longest shift you so could ever you do. As you said, you sat in a booth all day long. I saw Kirsty's little ears yeah. prick up, didn't you? <laughs> Hope for us all, eh, Kirsty? There is, there is definitely it? is. We did your own show on BBC Two. <laughs> <laughs> now then, the first episode went out last Thursday and here we've got Reese as Gary Bellamy about to meet his biggest fan. <laughs> And there's a lovely twist to that as well, because the actress playing your biggest fan is, in fact, your biggest she's, fan. She's my wife. I don't know if she's my biggest fan. She's just my wife. No, she does <laughs> love me. I love her too. And, um, and that is also... She's based that character on that I've got a real-life... Uh, I've got a real-life sort of uh, fan who runs a website. So, She's my only fan, and she also loves uh, Robson Green, and she set up a website, and uh, she comes to everything I do, all three of them, all three. She's not here today, sadly, and my, my, my wife met her, and she's kind of taken her voice slightly, and she's all right about it, the fan. Uh, uh, <laughs> Playing you, with fire. You are, you're all right about that. <laughs> yeah, she's fine. So, uh, yeah, so that's what that's... Now, I'm, I'm not joking about being a fan about Down the Line. I can remember the first time I heard it in the car, and I just thought it was a real phone-in mm. show I was listening to, just with some very twisted people, so I couldn't resist playing a clip. Oh, uh, and here we have uh, Gary talking to Wendy from Frinton-on-Sea. Oh, about... oh, that's my mum! <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> that's my, that's my, sorry. Is it your mum that's playing it? Or, no, it's who it's based on. Oh, based on your <laughs> yeah. mum. Nice. And they're chatting about dental care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Lucy again, basing that on my on my mum. How many you know, teeth yeah. does your mum have? She got, no, she's got all her teeth, thank God. <laughs> OK. Uh, um, Charlie Hickson told, told the Radio Times that he thinks you're the world's most convincing liar. Is that something you'd be flattered by? I think it's quite nice. I if, if I lie for a good reason, for a good cause, uh, I, I can lie. I can sort of pull it off. But um, I can't keep secrets. I'm not very good at that kind of thing. Or surprise. I'm terrible at birthdays and things like that because I just want to tell people I bought them. <laughs> but I can lie. You know, I mean, I've had, I've had in the past. I've lied many times. I did actually lie when I was very young. I won a, a poem competition at school and I copied a po uh, uh, Lenny Henry's uh, a, a rap from Lenny Henry television program. And I won this competition. <laughs> I read it out. And I won this thing. I got these awards and everyone said this is brilliant. And then about six months later, the teacher, the headmaster, came up to me and said, uh, "Last night we watched uh, Lenny Henry on telly, <laughs> and uh, either." You've written this thing and sent it off to him. He's performed it on television. Bearing in mind I was eight. <laughs> and he's either that he's accepted it, he's performed it, or you stole it from him. And that was a repeat last night. And it was a repeat. And uh, I did steal it. And they, they took my book tokens back. Oh. Two pounds book tokens. Oh. Oh. Did, you, did you get your start on Shooting Stars? Is that right? Yeah, I was a runner on Shooting break? Stars, yeah. How much? Did you get a week for that? <laughs> a week on that? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. What? But money wise, yeah, yeah, I didn't get paid anything. What, what did you do? Outrageous. I it's would just get so their that tea and coffee he for could them. Sit here and say that he was on it. That's I was on it. it yeah. yeah. I used to sit in for George Dawes, Matt Lucas. A natural just, fit. And wow. I, absolutely. Yeah. And I have to, I'd put, you know, when he, he would turn up later on in the day, and I have to sit there and play the drums, you know, and uh, and I got a bit more confident. And I'd end up trying to say some funny things, and they liked me, and I gave them a comedy tape that me and my friends had made at sixth form college. This is Reeves and Mortimer and Charlie Hickson, and that's how I got my that's how my career started. It just goes to show. I mean, there's a lot of young people that's in the audience right. today, and this idea you just you just got to put yourself out Absolutely. and about, and make things happen. Yeah, if you, I've got no contacts whatsoever, you know, in the business, uh, I didn't have, and uh, anyone can do it. Anyone, you know, there's no See, excuse. See, Kirsty, that's what I keep talking. <laughs> Just stay in the booth and everything will be I'll all stay right. With my yes. Thing. Now. <laughs> Tell you what, oh, no, I just wondered. I read that you um, only eat, you don't eat wet food. No. You've got this thing about your your food has to be dry. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> with I don't like, currants. I, <laughs> well, I can't eat. I don't like anything. No, I don't like wet food. Soups or I can eat chicken tikka masala. Is the wettest I'll go. Um, Why? 
uh, because I just don't like the... When I was younger, my brother would, fall, would put food down my mouth that I didn't like. And uh, he'd go, tie that and put it in my mouth. And I'd go, oh, I like baked beans. And I think I've got a phobia of, of wet food ever since. I'm, I'm scared that I'll be sick if I don't like the food. So I'd rather not put myself through it. just leave this person of your races hanging in the air? Yeah, look what you've done there. Sorry. Look what you've done. <laughs> oh. Now, I'd better tell you what's happening on today's show. After the hour. First, what do Nihal, Anne and Reese think of schools teaching seven-year-olds the basics of hiding the sausage? Is it too young, <laughs> too late, or just about right? <laughs> uh, email your thoughts to writestuff at 5.tv. Ed Balls has been working diligently on improving sex ed in schools uh, for some time and has decided that seven is the right age to teach youngsters the ins and outs. And while parents can currently pull kids out of sex ed classes if they wish, when these new rules come into play in September and they're going to be law the following year, that opt-out will be removed. Little Peter or Parveen will have to stay in class regardless of their faith or anything else. These lessons for seven-year-olds will focus on the importance of strong relationships and marriage. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but kids will also learn about sperm and eggs and how the two eventually meet. Uh, contraception and sexually transmitted diseases, you're not going to find out about those until later, uh, the first years of secondary school. Uh, Ed Ball says uh, even seven is the right age to talk about... Uh, Oh dear, there he is again. He says seven is the right age to start talking about these sensitive issues. Uh, the proliferation of pornography and explicit storylines on TV means, and this is his argument, that kids need to know more about sex at an earlier age. I think it's fair to say, Anne, that there's plenty of critics out there that say seven is too young, the Family Education Trust being And, of course, it depends what you're teaching them at seven. And it depends yeah. whether you're even teaching. I mean, yeah, you, you talked about, you know, hiding the sausage. Well, by seven, uh, little girls and little boys have noticed that there is a basic difference between yeah. them. And I think it's quite right that they should actually be able to openly discuss it. And if they're not getting open discussion at home, then they should at no least be getting out? it at school. The opt-out is worrying, but I think maybe the time has come for no opt-out, yeah. Because, I think we, because, I mean, we, because we all owe it to each other to make sure that all of us have a realistic attitude to sex. And I don't believe in teaching them too much at seven, for heaven's sake, no, but I actually do trust that probably the government guidelines don't advocate teaching them too much at seven. It's just an introduction yeah. to the fact that you can talk about it at all. Because mm. certainly by the time they leave primary school at 11, they should know most of what needs to be known, okay. I think. I, mean, I think Ed Balls is right. It's a changing world, and we've got to equip them for it. I mean, we, we have to bear in mind that in this country, Reese, that we, have, we are tops for teen pregnancy. Holland, which has this kind of sex education, uh, is at the bottom of the teen pregnancy lead. Is, is that convincing? Well, I don't think... You know, knowing this at seven isn't going to stop you getting pregnant. You, you don't intend to get pregnant young. I think that's an a, you know, yeah. it's accidental. But, but I think that, it is the, yeah, the earliest you know, the better. I mean, I think I was... I think at school... I, you know, I didn't get taught it at primary school, but I was aware in the playground, you know, you talk about it at that age, I'm pretty sure I knew what things were. I remember some of the things I do clearly remember the first time I heard the words penis and vagina, for example, were when I was about seven or eight. Because an older boy asked me if I had a vagina, and I said, yes. <laughs> and, and, I, and, he, and he laughed. Yeah. And, and then that was... A, I remember I was about seven. And that's the time when you go back and you ask the questions and you say, yeah. Mum, Dad, yeah. what is this? You know, I think it's good at seven. And then, you know, if I'd been seven and I had that knowledge, I could have said, I have a, a penis. And then I wouldn't have felt stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I think yeah, you should yeah, equip yeah, children with that. It's just about empowering It's just creating yeah, yeah. the climate where you can talk about these things. So, do, do, Nihal, do you worry that... Uh, that if we tell children about sex at seven, they're, they're going to try and put uh, practice, uh, put it into practice as soon as they can. That they'll all be. No, no, not at all. I mean, this seems very. It's scientific, is what they're teaching them. It's not. It's not pure in, in any way. I, I worry about the opt out though, because I think parents that care enough about their children that they don't want them to see this are the kind of parents, hopefully, that would be able to explain and articulate. Really, because I, I think it's just equally possible that the parents who mm. care so much they don't want their kids to be taught yeah. at school are the ones mm. who won't tell their and kids. But they also and... no, but they also may be the the kind of parents for religious reasons who construct a moral framework around the upbringing of their children and don't wish their children to see this because they believe that moral they have a, yeah, they have religion moral framework, at the heart. Moral framework, ethical framework. Mm. What what they're going to be teaching in schools are biological facts. Yeah, and mm. social framework. We're, what we're trying to do is equip children to be part of today's mm. society and not be extraordinary, not be opting out. And I also think if they do opt out anyway, what are the other kids going to think? Well, uh, well, uh, well that's an interesting point, whether it exposes kids to bullying. But Nihal is right. There are a lot of people out there, when we've done phone-ins on this before, it comes through loud and clear that parents feel they're their children and they should be able to choose uh, when they will impart well, this kind of information. A lot of parents feel that children are growing up you know, far too quickly, as you know, and we, as you said, Ed Balls believes that this is a changing world, but some parents believe that they should have the control yeah. over that, and they can have the control of it. And certainly people that call in my, my phone, in my radio phone-in show, 
do always say, you know, we, we're religious people and we believe that we're teaching them morals where they are not going to go and get pregnant at 15 or Well, then they need to be that. reassured. They, uh, they don't need to read the media headlines for a start because the minute the media talk about something like this, they talk, they talk about children of seven are going yeah. to be talk, taught all about AIDS yeah. and everything. Yeah. And I don't think it is that. They well, need to be reassured what they are going to be. Biological facts, yeah. yeah. Okay.